started. So my name is Kimberly, and I'm one of the reference librarians here at Seattle Central. Um, I'm very happy to see all of these bright and shiny faces. So um, I'm going to mention, like I told a couple of people, unfortunately there's no kitty in the library. So if you haven't had your lunch, stuff it in your mouth and then put it away. <laughs> Thank you. So um, you are at the Conversations um, on Social Issues, a weekly series that we host here. And we host this because we see this as an extension of our library's charge to promote freedom of ideas and freedom of information. So whether or not you agree with everything that is presented here or at any of our other conversations, I'll ask that everyone is respectful of both our speaker and each other and have a lively but uh, polite conversation. So we express this by providing this space. And if you want to learn more about this topic, we have some resources up here at the front. And also go to the reference desk, which is the big desk outside. You can't miss it. There's reference above it. And ask anyone there, and they'd be more than happy to show you some of the materials in our collection that might be of further use. So before we get started, I want to make sure that everyone knows that at the end of this, I'm going to ask everyone to take one of these little slips. And this is a survey to tell us what you'd like to see, what you liked about this series, what you didn't. Um, we'd like to keep adapting it so that it best suits your needs. So next week, if I think you all will actually be in class, most of you, but if you, if class was not happening, then you should stop by. We're gonna be having a special two hour discussion from 12 to one, John Martinez will be talking about political prisoners in the United States, and especially in the case of the um, Cuban Five. And from one to two, Phoebe Jewell and Marjorie Richards will facilitate a discussion entitled Cuba Libre, Gender and Sexuality in Cuba. So if you can join us for both of those hours or part of it, we'd love to see you all. Oh, no. That's next Thursday. This happens every Thursday from 12 to 1 in the library, except for the first Thursday of the quarter. So today, your classmate, for some most people here, I think, Nat Steiner, who is a Seattle Central student, will be leading us in a discussion about segregation in South Africa and its repercussions and parallels. Let's welcome him. Nowadays, as Keith mentioned in class before, 
they're the Kong people who um, still practice click-based languages. You'll find them in Botswana more so in Namibia as well. Um, but encountering the Khoi and Sam people, the Dutch found their first set of a first type of society that they could enslave, use as forced labor, in helping to establish that garden and establish the basic provisions that were needed to supply um, the fruits and vegetables to the Dutch East um, And before I talk more about them, I'll mention the various types of Europeans that came along with the Dutch East India Company. Besides the original Dutch, there were also many German mercenaries that came along, as well as French Huguenots which brought along the modern wine industry. So soon after the advent of um, the company garden, which showed that the land was in fact fertile enough for that, um, they found that the climate, which is very similar to the Mediterranean in the Cape, um, was great for wine growing. So the French Huguenots brought that skill set with them and established many wineries that still exist today in the Western Cape province, um, which of course leads to a higher demand for labor, which will be a key factor. So, Looking at the various types of Europeans that were brought in, the native Khoi and Sam peoples that were enslaved, and then the types of people that the Dutch brought in to supplement this labor pool, being slaves from Madagascar, Malaya, Java, parts of southern India, having all these different people brought in from various genetic pools, all working together led to a high rate of intermarriage um, that led to what we now call the covered peoples. So ironically, through having a society <coughs> that was based on people of color, in the labor pool, and then white masters at the United States history as well. That segregation that was very much enforced in the Cape at the time between um, labor and masters, ironically led to the most genetically diverse ethnic group that we see today, which are the South African colors. Colored is definitely a term that has a lot of nasty connotations in the United States regarding people of color being defined by their lack of whiteness. But color is something that's really embraced by this group in South Africa. And interestingly enough, despite being so genetic, genetically mixed, the fact that they've had generation upon generation of cultural development leads to the colors really seeing themselves as kind of a monolithic group, not so much a mixed race group. I have a friend back in South Africa that has a colored mom and an ethnically Indian dad, and he goes, I'm mixed race because I'm half colored, half Indian. Which is basically saying that he's like part Dutch, part German, part native Bushman, part Indian, but that makes them just multiracial because of that. Um, so looking at these various interests in the Cape, we had a huge section of society that was essentially the colored peoples as the Khoi and Sam population fell off because of disease and through intermarriage and mixing with other people in the really cool. um, And at the same time, we saw an increase of that population driven by the French Huguenots and the German mercenaries that kind of established themselves into the Dutch civil society that was developing in Cape Town. Cape Town was never supposed to be necessarily a colonial outpost. It was initially just supposed to be a garden, a place that you can supply the needs of the Dutch East India Company. But, as inevitably happens, things didn't go the way they expected them to. Um, with a lot of Huguenots that were emigrating to Cape Town at the time, it led to a generation of Dutch people that then referred to themselves as Africans. So if people are familiar with the term Afrikaner, Afrikaner refers to the early Dutch descent, mostly Dutch descended people that were in Cape Town, the Western Cape province, um, as it's referred to as today. And they called themselves Afrikaner, which is Dutch for African. And it's believed that that came about um, when there was a Dutch policeman that had stopped a locally South African born Dutchman for some sort of infraction. And he would claim, this isn't fair, you don't understand my culture, I can say Afrikaner, I'm an African. So that was a very, very pivotal moment, at least as Afrikaners see it, in establishing themselves as part of that land. No longer are they seeing themselves as affiliated with the Netherlands, but they didn't see themselves as part of Africa. We can look at parallels to the story in the United States with early English settlers seeing themselves as part of the land. Um, but this was a very pivotal moment in having white civil society developing itself and settling itself in Southern Africa. Um, however, their ability to formed their own Dutch-derived civil society was hampered early on. In 1815, there were British trading interests, um, and as they were very competitive among European powers at the time, British trading interests wanted in on the access that Cape Town brought on the trade between Europe and Southeast Asia. So it was after the Napoleonic Wars um, with the weakened Dutch Empire that the British were actually seized control of the Cape Colony. 
Um, so at that point, a style of English urban governance was imposed on what was largely that Dutch settlement at the time with a massive total population. And it's here where we're going to find another term called four-checker, um, as I pointed out there, which are the early Afrikaners. Before Afrikaners actually came to the point of using that word to, to refer to their entire ethnic group, four-checkers was the word that was used. And they largely at that time started fleeing Cape Town, or even fleeing the Cape Colony entirely, specifically because they did not want to be under the domain of the English. They did not want to be under British rule at the time. They saw themselves as the whites of Africa that were ordained by God to have this land, to embrace that land, to nourish it, to grow it. And they weren't going to let any kind of European power stop them. So the early Afrikaners, the four trekkers, left on what became a pastoral lifestyle wet or eastwards into South Africa. So we look at Manifest Destiny in the United States as this Western migration. Seattle's kind of the end of the chain of that. But in South Africa, it's reversed, so it's eastwards out. And a massive problem with that was there were other people settled in eastern South Africa. Just as how the early Dutch found the Khoi and San peoples, the four trekkers that were leaving eastwards ran into expanding kingdoms that were moving really southwards. In this case, King Shaka's kingdom. If anyone's familiar with King Shaka, I think there's a movie made about him. He was the Zulu king at the time, who was consolidating various Ngumi tribal authorities to form what was the Zulu kingdom. So at this time, a massive transformation was happening in terms of the power structure of tribes in Southern Africa. Because today, you can look at the major tribal groups in South Africa, the Zulus, the Kosa, the Sutu, the Ndebele, um, and many of these were consolidated under what became King Shaka's empire. Um, even to this day, there are smaller, kind of, branch offs of various ethnic groups like of the Kosa people who are who lean towards identifying themselves with the greater Kosa population specifically because of what happened during the planet and that they were consolidated to kind of a more general identity. Um, but this led to a massive clash of expansion. So as we had the four trekkers, the early Afrikaners migrating eastwards, they were running directly into the expansion of King Shaka's empire. And what has to be understood about this kind of version of manifest destiny with the four trekkers is it wasn't just like, we have the stories in the United States of people in like ox carts going across westward, establishing little cities and towns, villages on their way. But for early Afrikaners, they specifically wanted their own domain. Every family wanted their own space so far that he was quoted in a book about the early Afrikaners, um, the white track dream, that was saying that every family, every man didn't want to see the fire of his neighbor. So if you can see the smoke from the fire of neighboring family or group that left from Cape Town, that was too close. You wanted to be so far away that you could not see any existence of other people within your space. That was completely your domain. Africa, to them, was this blank slate for them to take the land um, and create an image of kind of this Calvinist Africa, this Calvinist dream. Um, so at the time, as they were moving outwards, that led to many small wars with King Shaka's army. Um, that was very notorious for being brutal. King Shaka often trained his soldiers by having them run barefoot across thorns. So they would learn to run miles and miles off um, without any inhibition. And at this point, we can see all the Boer republics that established. So a lot of people might be familiar with the term Boer. Um, Boer is just Afrikaans for farmer. It's actually considered somewhat derogatory nowadays but these were the early Boer republics that were established through this eastward migration of Boer traders. So they all came out of Cape Town here, or small towns that were established around Cape Town, the Rhinelands. And as they came outwards, you could see all the various nations that were established. So even though there would be some early Boer traders that would establish capital, establish political authority, you would still have the population dispersed so far outwards. So within the Orange Free State, for example, um, I'm not sure if this was the early capital, but the modern day one is Bloemfontein. And Despite having some small concentrations, you would still have families dispersed all across this land with the idea that you don't want to see your neighbors, you're going to have all the space to yourself. So that led to so much fragmentation across, um, politically across South Africa. So you see Natal, um, Lesotho land, Griqua land was actually very prominent in the sense it was the only colored poor republic. Um, I believe it was taken over by one of the neighboring republics very early on, so there isn't a very long history of a colored republic but that did in fact exist at one point. Um, you see the South African Republic, um, Stella Land, all these different areas that were established. So at the time, South Africa was really a collision of these individual aspiring republics. 
So the Battle of Blood River was one of the most prominent wars um, that defined the clash between both whites and Kinshaka's army. Um, at the time, there were both clashes between the British and the Afrikaners, between the British and Zulu Kingdom, the Afrikaners and Zulu Kingdom. This one was specifically between the Afrikaners and Kinshaka. And it's called the Battle of Blood River because the story goes that the Afrikaners slaughtered so many Zulus that the river ran red with blood. Um, that was in 1838 between Andres Pretorius and Dingane, who was King Shaka's son. And that really fermented the idea of the South African version of Manifest Destiny through the Day of the Vow. The Day of the Vow is December 16th today in South Africa to celebrate the victory in the Battle of Blood River. Today it's called, I think, Heritage Day, um, to kind of gloss over that entire white domination history. Like Thanksgiving. Oh, I just said like Thanksgiving. Yeah, a little bit. Not, not too different, I guess. Slaughter. Yeah. Um, so that still exists today in Pretoria, the capital of South Africa. That's a monument for the Day of the Vow. Um, so it's really tricky as to how white South Africans nowadays, specifically people who are Afrikaans derived, Afrikaans, look at monuments like these because they see this as very integral to their history in South Africa a moment of triumph in their development and expansion throughout the entire country, while the majority of the population sees it as something representing their subjugation. Um, but that's something that's still tricky today. Um, but the Day of the Vow, that's something, if you have to remember anything about Eastern migration, it would be that. That really cemented their mentality they in South Africa. To this day, the city I live in, Peter Marysburg, they actually transplanted and rebuilt the church in the middle of the town. That was the church of the Day of the Vow, where they took their Bible and they sat down and dedicated this church to the Day of the Vow, to the Battle of the Blood River. Um, so today, a lot of Afrikaners still look back and see, like, this is our moment, this is the moment for our people. Um, but just like with the Cape Colony, eastward migration and kind of self-governance of the Boers and the Boer Trekkers could only go on for so long when the British found more reason to have an interest in South Africa and started also expanding <coughs> eastwards out of Cape Town. And that led to the fight for natural resources, diamonds, gold. Um, even the word in Sutu for Johannesburg is Egoli, which is city of gold. So people saw that as the place where you could make your fortune, this town that was kind of rebuilt out of the fight for natural resources. Even today, people joke that Johannesburg streets are paved with gold because there's actually gold dust that just is mixed in with the cement itself. So Johannesburg's roads and highways have gold dust in them. Um, which is kind of ironic and a little bit sad. But, um, this led to the first of the Anglo Boer Wars, in which um, the Boers really used a lot of guerrilla tactics that outpaced them, which also sounds a little bit like the United States history. Um, however, this did not necessarily last. Um, the second Boer War, which ended in 1902, led to the Fort Trekkers giving up, um, ceding control to the British because of the concentration camps. People say that modern day concentration camps were really kind of cemented in their design um, during the Second Anglo World War. So what essentially happened was the British went through various towns that were populated by Afrikaners, took up their women and children, and then starved them to death. And this was something that was really well publicized in Britain at the time. Um, the press in London really made a big deal out of this with kind of Victorian society at the time seeing it as just how can we be such savages? How can the English be doing this um, down in South Africa? And you could also argue that it was done to fellow white people, which helped engender more sympathy, which I agree with. Um, but those were big motivations for the British public turning upon the British action in South Africa at the time. So that led to, um, at the end, the Union of South Africa that was developed. Um, because the sentiment was so overwhelmingly negative towards British action. The British decided, even though that the Fort Trekkers um, essentially gave up, they would have the union, which would be a co-opting of white power in South Africa between Afrikaner society and English society. And interestingly enough, this actually led to increased political power for the Afrikaners, um, because it was a system in which one man, one vote for only white men, of course. Um, and for the first time, South Africa had actually defined whiteness. We talk about the definition of whiteness in the United States, how this come about through various Supreme Court cases, um, incidents regarding like, intermarriage, for example, how do we define how white someone is. In South Africa, from a white mentality, during that time, there's only two races that mattered, if you were Afrikaner or if you were English. 
Um, to them, they were separate races. They were two completely separate types of people. But this union that was joined, it was a political union, but it was an economic union, and one that brought people together under the new white racial identity. So before you can understand how apartheid developed and came about, you have to understand this formative moment in defining whiteness in South Africa. Um, so at that time, with increased Afrikaner political power, this led to parties that were voted in their favor. Um, the early party that existed at the time, it had a lot of Afrikaners, um, for example, Jan Smuts was one of the first, I believe the first prime minister in the union. He was ethnically identified as an Afrikaner, but he was very much aligned with British trading interests. And a lot of Afrikaners came to see this as in their best interest, because at the time, with the concentration camps and slash and burn policies that really decimated the Afrikaner lifestyle, you have to remember that their whole mentality revolved around having their own domain, having their own land. And after the Second Anglo Boer War, which is now called the South African War, um, just to recognize all types of people of color that were involved, Afrikaners, their lifestyle was gone. They didn't have their land, they didn't have their families. It was believed that one fourth of the Afrikaner population was gone after that war. So with the ongoing development based on natural sources of Johannesburg, um, of cities like Durban, near the coast, which was revolving around the sugar industry, a lot of Afrikaners saw that their only choice for work was to move into the city. And you can actually kind of parallel this almost to um, after the Civil War, the northern migration of African Americans from the south and the north to industry to cities, coming from what was largely a rural lifestyle. That's almost a weird parallel that you can see, um, because these people really didn't have much. So in entering the cities, they wanted to just find work, find anything for their families. But this was the first time that major South African cities were seeing an influx of the Afrikaner population. So for them, in what they saw of their own land, their own country, to be entering into a place that was dominated by English commercial interests, <coughs> black labor, Indian labor, colored labor, it was a complete psychological shock for Afrikaners. It was just reminding them once again that their country was lost, that they had lost the nation, their domain. Um, and at the time, it was actually really tough um, for some families just to want to live next door to people of color. I know at the Apartheid Museum in South Africa, they were talking about a specific case in which there was an Afrikaner family that was working in Johannesburg, working for a food seller who was a Muslim colored man. And the wife refused to work because under no circumstances had she ever thought that she would have to be employed by someone of color. Um, it was just a ridiculous notion of her, to her. The fact that she would never have to look at people of color, um, deal with them in any kind of interaction, specifically because the rural lifestyle of the Afrikaners, the poor trekkers at the time, a lot of them did in fact rely upon um, black labor, but in many instances we saw that there was a lot more self-reliance at the time. Um, many of them were exclusively Ford Trek was exclusively white, so in some of these communities they really did never have to interact with any, except for wartime, interact with any black South Africans. And I include that picture of Mahatma Gandhi here, just so I could quickly touch on the British segregation that existed as well. In the Cape Colony, the British did still segregate um, the colors from white people, just as the early Dutch government did. Um, but the British were necessarily much better when it came to segregation. In the Tau province, which is the largest, um, which was at the time the largest Indian population outside of India, so many ethnic Indians were indentured laborers that came in um, from central and southern India to work on the plantations. Mahatma Gandhi actually lived in South Africa for 22 years, promoting the legal interests of Indian South Africans. And the city I lived in, Peter Maritzburg, has a statue to honor him outside the train station because he was actually kicked out of the white section at the time. Um, but it's interesting to look back at the actual case that Gandhi was fighting, because people kind of, as we romanticize most famous debt figures like Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, he was actually wrote in one of his dissertations that Indian South Africans should not have to be put to the level of riding in the same area as blacks. <sighs> Um, so it wasn't just giving Indians the privilege to ride where the whites are, but so they didn't have to ride with the blacks. So this is a pretty contentious aspect of, Maga or of Gandhi's legal background. Um, but nonetheless, he's still honored in Peter Marysburg. He, of course, as most ethnic Indians overseas and people in India see, Indian South Africans do revere Gandhi quite a bit. 
So moving forward to 1948, um, the National Party was elected, and they were an extremely right-wing, pro-Afrikaner party that, with this huge influx of Afrikaners into the cities, they wanted to do something that would uplift the people, that would push them forward. Um, and this is where apartheid came into place. Apartheid is Afrikaans for um, apartness, the state of being separate. And a lot of people think of apartheid as just this one like, monolithic policy that came in and separated blacks and whites. But it was much more complicated than that. So not only was it not just separating blacks and whites, but Indians and colors, um, and creating a system that on any level didn't want people to racially mix with so Indian and black or white and black. So in some cases, for example, like we can look at that public restroom there, black colors and Asians, and then of course there's separate bathrooms for whites. So in some examples of public infrastructure, they did separate based on white and non-white, but in some cases it became so specific that it'd be white, black, Indian colors. So that's where a lot of the inconsistencies existed with apartheid. And it was really a series of policies post-1948 that were implemented on top of the existing segregationist infrastructure. So it wasn't so much that all these policies came out at once, but gradually you get the policies that reaffirmed um, the ban on interracial marriage, um, the past laws, so all non-white South Africans would have to carry a pass card on them that would state their name, their family, their racial identity, and that dictated where you could go. So for example, my host family that in South Africa, um, where I lived in the Indian township, my ethnic Indian family, he actually had his old pass card from back in the day that showed that his name was Marcus Pediachi. Um, he was, I think it said specifically, he was a Tamil ethnic Indian, born in Durban, raised in Peter Middlesbrough. Um, and with that card, he could only go into downtown and certain neighborhoods during the daytime, and only for certain reasons, like whether he's working or going to certain businesses that could only cater to ethnic Indians. Um, so after a certain time of night, there'd be a curfew imposed, he had to go home. Um, so I just have that existence where you could only go to certain places for certain times and go back to your domain. That really helped reinforce the whiteness that was established in this new South Africa. Um, because if you have all the services, all the public services, private businesses that cater to a white society, and you only rely on people of color for labor, then your national identity, how I would as a white South African feel about my country, the image that comes to mind is one that was very consistent with whiteness. Um, it's kind of European, Southern African culture. On no level would people have to take the cultural backgrounds or interactions with Zulus or with Indians and incorporate that to the national identity. And this was further reaffirmed by the development of the Bantu status. So the white South African government at the time, the National Party, wants to legally reinforce that black South Africans specifically we're not citizens of South Africa. If we're gonna create this white South Africa, we're gonna have an all white state, one in which South Africans being black, that's, that's no such thing. Um, so they would create these various boundary states. So Boko Tatswana, Siskai, Gazankuru, Nguane, Kwan, Nivele, so on and so forth. Um, were all these parts of South Africa that represented kind of the former tribal lands um, of different tribes. And even if you were being, for example, if I was a Zulu, um, my homeland, my Bantu stand would be Kwazulu, which is this weird patchy like blue you see here that's not even fully connected. Um, they're really haphazardly drawn. Here's the city of Durban, which is the largest city in that area. So many Zulus were laborers in Durban, but they would live in townships outside the city. So you would have the white neighborhoods, white suburbs, downtown, and then on the outskirts of every South African city with the development of townships. So there were areas that were designed specifically to be temporal. They were not meant to be settled. They were not meant to be places that generation after generation could call home. They were places where people would work. In some cases, you even have your women and children in the city specifically, but by no means is this your home. So I may live in Durban, I may live in a township, go into town during the day as an electric worker or something, um, but my pass card would say that I am a citizen of KwaZulu. I'm not a citizen of South Africa. So if there were circumstances that arose where the government wanted to raise a township to develop a new suburb for white people, they could say, well, you have to go home to KwaZulu, you're being deported out of South Africa. And that would actually happen. People would be deported out of the city to this tribal land because you're not South African. Even if I was born and raised in Durban, my ethnic identity means I have to be part of KwaZulu. That is my country. So that was the really messy thing that came uh, with nationality in South Africa.
Um, so all this kind of pale color, that's South Africa, that's white South Africa. I can freely move if I'm white from Cape Town to Bloemfontein, Johannesburg, Pretoria, and all the land in between there that also included all the most prime agricultural land as well. Because um, South Africa today has a pretty large industry um, in agriculture, um, a lot of plantations that oftentimes people would just kind of go back to the idea of the domain. They would make their money in the city, they kind of move back outwards, develop a plantation, many of which are still white controlled today. Agriculture in South Africa is still white dominated. Um, but nonetheless, this nationality issue was one that we can very to South Africa. So this is just a picture, a more modern picture of downtown Johannesburg. Um, nowadays you won't find too many white people there, but downtown Johannesburg was where only white people could live. So at the time, all these buildings you see here were all developed, built during the apartheid era. So just imagine that in every single one of these buildings, the only residents were white people. Only white people could live in every building here. Only white people could live in these white colored buildings, um, providing services for the first world economy that South Africa saw in South Dakota. Um, so during the day, black people would be in the streets, doing menial jobs, and then they'd leave. And it'd be completely white at that time. But as with everything, you can only go so long without a lot of resistance. Um, so the township populations continued to soar in South Africa as they greatly outnumbered the populations of the city cores and the inner ring suburbs. Black consciousness really came to the forefront in South Africa. Um, I can go backwards and talk about the African National Congress, which was developed in the early 1900s. They're currently the ruling political party, and they were the largest activist group during the apartheid era. Um, so black consciousness didn't just start in 1976, but I think in this timeline it's a good place to jump to um, with the Soweto uprising. So Soweto is the largest township in South Africa. Population estimates range from 3.5 million to 4.5 million. Um, nowadays, it's part of the city of Johannesburg. Um, but at the time, Soweto was a separate city outside Johannesburg that just so happened to be bigger and contained all of the labor, all of the people of color. Um, Soweto was for Southwestern Township. Um, and June 16th saw the uprising of students specifically due to a new educational policy. So at the time, at least within Soweto and in townships in Johannesburg, black children would be educated in English. That wasn't the case across all of South Africa. Sometimes there'd be an Afrikaans medium, there'd be an English medium. But when it came to education for black children, it was mostly an English medium. And because of the lack of care or training or even just skilled teachers to provide for these students, the majority of the population, most students already failed in the school. If you're living in a society in which you are, by every metric, a second class citizen, or I can say a third class citizen, you're living under police brutality, you're living with restriction of movement, um, poor housing conditions, you're not going to do well in school. Your environment is overwhelmingly one in which you are not motivated to perform well on your tests or whatever topic it will be. And in 1976, remember this is still the National Party government, so the Afrikaans government, they wanted to implement a policy where they, in one day, switched the English medium to an Afrikaans medium. So most of these kids that weren't even fluent in Afrikaans would have to start learning everything in Afrikaans. So it's imagining like our classes today, we learn primarily in English. If we all had to start learning in French tomorrow with no expectation for a learning curve for that, that's what's happening with these kids. They were switching languages like that. And they weren't going to stand for that. So the Soweto uprising was June 16th when students came out and were protesting against this. Not just the fact they were switching to Afrikaans because you'll see a lot of photos from the uprising that will say like down in Afrikaans and a lot of people interpret that as saying they wanted to abolish Afrikaans as a subject or something that existed as part of their lives. But it was more so rebelling against all those pressures, those forces that were pushing them down from having a proper education, from having any opportunity because even if they did excel in school, the glass ceiling was a reality for these people. You would still live in your township. You would still be captured, I don't know, being a minor. Your best opportunity was going off to a gold mine or a diamond mine, just from your own life, being separated from your family. There was no future for black South Africans or for most South Africans of color. Under no circumstances could you see yourself having, from a material standard, a very successful life. And so that's Hector Peterson, believed to be the first child shot during that presence, which is a very famous photo. And there's still a Hector Peterson memorial there today. Um, because this was something that was really broadcasted across the world. South Africa was already a country suffering from divestment. 
um, with many countries who were refusing to trade with the apartheid government. But when this image was broadcasted across the world of Hector Peterson, it was kind of a poster picture, like this is apartheid South Africa, a place that shoots children. Um, so that was not very good for the government at the time of the image. At the time, there were other um, African National Congress figures, such as Steve Biko. Um, he became very iconic after he was murdered by the police in Pretoria in 1977, so just one year after the riots. If anyone really watched Disney Channel movies when they were young, they might have seen The Color of Friendship, mm -hmm. some people. That was based off the story of a South African exchange student. If you remember the scene where there were protests outside the South African embassy, it was for Steve Biko. Um, and it was funny, that movie was about a South African exchange girl in the United States, very sheltered, her father was a policeman. Um, she had no idea who Steve Biko really was except for a troublemaker. And you can actually see a lot of that white South African ignorance that was portrayed really well in this Disney movie. Mm -hmm. um, for example, their maid had an ANC flag, and she said, put that down, that's the flag of the devils. Um, white South African existence was one that was so sheltered to the uprisings at the time, to everything going around them in the same country, in a neighboring city, basically in the same city. Um, so it just stop for a moment and think about all of this strife, and all of this protest, all of this violence was occurring within miles of a very peaceful white existence, a very waspy existence as we'd say. You can look at commercials from 1970s, 1980s South Africa, and they had that same kind of like happy jolly like, tune you see like American commercials like there's a commercial for Chevrolet from the 70s that said Chevrolet is all about South Africa, rugby, grilled meat, sunny skies, it's so South African. <laughs> Nothing about violence and segregation and disease, because that's not South Africa. Um, but at the time, the South African government was getting very, very weary of their international reputation and what it could potentially do um, to the loans that they had taken out. Um, so at this point, South Africa was becoming a very desperate state, even if they didn't ever trade that to the world. Um, so a nuclear weapons program was actually developed throughout the 1980s, the assistance of the Israelis. They had those weapons pointed directly at neighboring states like Angola, Mozambique. Um, those were former Portuguese colonies that became independent in the late 70s. You actually saw a lot of um, white Portuguese people leaving on their yachts and private jets for South Africa because they wanted to go to the last white safe haven. <laughs> if anyone's familiar with Nando's, if they've been to the UK or Australia, Nando's is like a Portuguese real estate company. They're actually from South Africa, founded by one of the Portuguese immigrants who came to Johannesburg. So that's just an interesting fun fact. But South Africa was very weird of their neighbors because they were so eager to take shelter um, for the ANC figures. So a lot of training that occurred, both violent and nonviolent, occurred in neighboring states. Um, and I think one thing that I haven't touched on that before going to this, I'll mention. If you have to remember something very clearly about apartheid, is that apartheid was not just segregation, but it was white affirmative action. Apartheid was white affirmative action specifically for Afrikaners. So during this whole time that I'm discussing, from 1948 through the 1980s, the development of South African industry and public corporations were all done in the name of boosting white people, boosting Afrikaners. So we already had, during this whole time, many English companies that were related to mining, telecommunications, um, banking specifically, all things that are very English that you would expect of people um, with that kind of business acumen. As we, when I think of London, when you think of Britain, you think of those kind of things. Britain's always been like that, and you saw that with most South Africans. Um, but many public corporations were established to employ the Afrikaners during this time. So when we move up to the 1980s, 1970s, Afrikaners are no longer this impoverished group that are trying to struggle to make a living in the city. There's South African Airways, the South African National Rail Corporation, the ESCOM, which is the National Power Company, public schools, the police force. So all the infrastructure. Everything. All public infrastructure in South Africa was done with the priority of employing Afrikaners specifically. So over the next few decades after 40, up to where we are now, Afrikaners are almost at parity with the English. They enjoy the same wealthy lifestyle. Um, in fact, they're more comfortable because they've gone from a group of people that has a history of being subjugated and pushed out of the farmlands, and now being people that basically get a handout from the government. Afrikaners were very used, in that used to in that generation of getting handouts. Their job was handed out, their home was handed out. Many home subsidies existed that people could, just like the United States, people could very cheaply afford due to loans that were given out primarily to white people in the 50s. Same thing happened in South Africa in the 50s and 60s. There are countless neighborhoods 
that were designed in mind of having poor white people having their own home, having their own job. So moving up to now, white people are solid. They have their lifestyle set up for them. White poverty is very small. Um, but then back to where we are now, the late 80s, we saw a lot of incursions into neighboring countries, um, invasions that were very violent. We saw a draft of white South Africans. So a lot of white South African men to this day have that same kind of Vietnam War era shell shock to them. They talk about going to the townships to patrol them. They talk about going to Angola, to Botswana, and kicking down doors and shooting people. And that's a collective trauma that exists among a lot of middle-aged, older, some white South African men. Um, but you could say that's only adding to all the brutalization that exists in South Africa among all people of color, people that have experienced countless incidents of police brutality and enforcement of policies that kept them apart. So at this point, South Africa, and to this day still is, a very brutalized nation, one in which most people will have very troubling encounters with the police, or nowadays crime, which I'll get to in a moment. But throughout all of this, the late 80s political struggles, we saw that the National Party finally decided to go to talk to the ANC. So Nelson Mandela, this whole time, was on Garden Islands. He basically South African Alcatraz. He spent many years in prison, um, along with other former ANC figures that were more of the mental aspect of it. They wrote a lot of me during that time, but they couldn't physically involve themselves with anything. And then we had the other members of the ANC who were hiding in the neighboring countries, as I mentioned. Um, but they all reviewed Nelson Mandela, and he was seen as this great state, statesman representation of the ANC. So when he was released from prison in 1990, the next four years, we saw a lot of talks between the National Party and the ANC, and they decided to have a government in which the ANC would gradually take over. We would have the black government that white people were always so scared of. Um, and that was in 1994, when Nelson Mandela was democratically elected. Um, and of course, I can't describe all of the violence and turmoil at this time, the time I have, but we saw a huge rise in right-wing organizations at that time. The AWB um, was led by a very, very kind of stereotypical bore of an Afrikaner, as people would call him. Very kind of rural mentality, he loved his guns. Mm -hmm. um, and he led a militia that gathered thousands of people that would protest through Johannesburg. They were committing acts of terrorism. They bombed the airport in Johannesburg. Um, they were destroying other public infrastructure works. They actually invaded um, a conference center in Johannesburg where they were having talks between the two governments. Um, they actually hijacked a tank and went down a public street and broke open the door um, to protest the coming black government, as they saw. But despite that, the ANC did in fact gain leadership. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out in 1995, which was to discuss um, the transgressions of the white government to have a chance to openly discuss what had happened, just have that dialogue, that forum. People criticized the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because there was no component that could prosecute, but this was very much backed by Desmond Tutu, if people are familiar, um, a former archbishop of the Anglican Church in Southern Africa, um, and he was very much emphasizing forgiveness, so that was a big thing that went at this time. But around the same time, we saw the implementation of the current South African Constitution, which was what well, is the most liberal in design. Execution is only so-so as everything is regarding policy, but it has protections against discrimination on race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, and birth. So that's pretty comprehensive. If we look up as we look at the United States Constitution as one that can protect to this day. It's a living, breathing document from 1776. But this was the creation of something new, 1994, 1995. It's the only one in the world that prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. Hate crimes are still a big issue, but nonetheless, in theory, this is the best constitution you could ask for. Um, and this is where I'm kind of going to quickly jump into how post-apartheid many of the same policies exist in place, many of the same um, government programs that reinforce segregation are still happening. So post-apartheid we see, in theory, black people, all people of color have opportunity to education, to jobs. We see a huge black middle class in South Africa right now, um, programs that are for black affirmative action regarding government tenders, um, even in education. I had a lot of white friends in South Africa that were very angry that they would have to get a 90% on their final exams to apply to a university, while black students only need 65 or 70 percent. So we talk about affirmative action being troublesome in the United States, but South Africa, it's a very, very clear cut. It's 
saying straight up, black people have been denied opportunities for generations, white people have had opportunities, so you need a 90% passing mark because we're going to save spaces in universities for black students specifically. Even Indians and colors are tiers, so it's something like black students need a 65 to 70 percent on some exams, colors need a 75, Indians need an 80 to 85 point to make 90 percent, and it's very clear cut. Um, however, if we look at um, the reality of where people live, townships, um, as I discussed earlier, they're still there. They're bigger than they've ever been before. And the South African government in trying to push for greater housing for people of color is leading to the development of new neighborhoods in the very same townships that were designed by the National Party. So expanding those same communities could make sense in theory because they're where now the current generation, that's what they know is their home, but it's not promoting any kind of racial mixing in South Africa. It's keeping things very segregated. Um, and I'm just quickly showing Mokomeni, which was the township that I worked in full time and volunteered, I should say. Um, lots of Mbani is an organization that I personally worked with, and I just referenced them because they represented the story of a locally run and managed organization that works for people infected and affected by HIV and AIDS. And I say that specifically because just as disease, scurvy in this case, kind of pushed for the development of the Cape Town um, Company Gardens, segregation that exists today in South Africa is leading to the proliferation of disease. And Purple Medi in this case, this very isolated community 30 miles north away from the larger city of Peter Marisburg, so disconnected from work opportunities, we see 80% unemployment and 40 to 50% rate of HIV infection. Um, and this is a population of about 40,000 people, but we can't say for sure. Tuberculosis is also becoming a huge problem. So by expanding housing in these very same areas, we're only increasing population density in places where disease is in fact proliferating. People are still being born, and children are being born with HIV, TB is being contracted from a very young age. Um, so that's a massive issue. Urban policy in South Africa is one that's trying to bridge the divide between communities that have been systematically segregated for generations. So it's a very tricky matter as to how to integrate places now. Because in South Africa, you see some racial integration among the middle class, where some whites are moving out of their neighborhoods, and then you see blacks and Indian moving upwards, moving out. Um, but for the most part, South Africa is as segregated as ever. And in fact, income inequality um, is higher than it was during the peak of the party in South Africa. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, quickly touching on crime. A lot of people might have heard the very notorious crime stories from South Africa, some of the highest incidences of rape in the world, murder, carjacking. And you can completely attribute this to the fact that South Africa is a very brutalized society. As I mentioned earlier, people have experiences as being harassed by the police. Um, and that's led to generations of people that don't understand what it means to work with a police force you can trust. You cannot trust the police. In South Africa, private security forces outnumber the police four to one. You see private security vehicles everywhere before you'll see a police car. Um, because if you can afford to have private security, you're going to pay for that. South Africa is a country of many gates, walls, things that on a micro level reinforce segregation. So white neighborhoods before that felt very free to just have their open lawn now have gates and barbed wire, electric fences. That's the theme we'll see all over South Africa. A few people I knew that did not have a gate blew my mind. I could not comprehend it. I was so used to having to go through a series of gates and locks and everything. Um, because crime is so bad. Um, granted, people say that crime is getting better compared to the 90s after the government transition, but it's still something that all South Africans have to live with. And this reinforces the paranoia that not only white South Africans have due to generations of being told you must be scared of black people, but black South Africans have due to all the trauma that they've endured for generations upon generations now. And in places like Mpubo Mani that I just showed, they disproportionately suffer from crime in places where there isn't as much private security um, to kind of safeguard the rich. You have more incidences of rape and burglary, but they go unreported. So at this point in South Africa, crime is something that everyone has to look with. You know, talk to any South African. They either have been raped, they know someone that's been raped, and that's a very stark reality. That's something that many South Africans have to live with. And if you look on the whole scale of society that so many people have been sexually abused, they've suffered armed robbery, that has directly been correlated to white flight as well. There's so many whites having left South Africa since 1994, about 20%. We're actually seeing an influx of white South Africans coming back. Many of them seeing potential opportunities with Southern African business. 
um, people will just be nostalgic for home, but um, that's still been a big thing attributed to crime. So if I had to kind of sum up inequality today in South Africa, crime, um, environmental issues, access to public services, all of these differ depending on your class and your race. And this is something that South Africa's gonna have to live with and deal with for many years to come. I'll close it on that. Back to our curriculum and our anarchy, I think uh, District 9 might be useful for looking at this. Um, how do you see the, the usefulness of, of that film with uh, understanding how fucked up uh, South Africa is? I think District 9, especially being something that was written by a South African, does a very good job of paralleling the experience of people of color in South Africa under a white government. I mean, in that movie, people are familiar, it has the idea that aliens. Um, became trapped on Earth, and the South African government was dealing with these aliens and creating townships for them. What really happened to those aliens, the prawns they called them, is what really happened to black South Africans. People on a whim would be moved out of their community. They'd be assigned a certain township. They'd be forced to move out to a different township on a whim. Thousands of people would be relocated. Even in Popo Mani that I showed you, that was land that all the people that lived there talked to the mothers, the grandmothers. They were like, I'm from Durban, I'm from Peter Maritzburg, but the government said I had to move and they were forced on this piece of land in the hills, miles away. So what happened there is what really happened to Black South Africans. I'm curious if you ever, like, in your travels, saw, because I'm sure there, there must still be, a, at some point, a poor Afrikaner population. That's a really good question. So my question is, is if those poor Afrikaners identify more with poor Blacks or with Afrikaners who are in a more elite position they have their own identity. Um, a lot of white South Africans will make poor Afrikaners a lot of jokes. There's a neighborhood in Peter Maritzburg called Orabi, and they'll call them Orabites, or they'll make fun of someone calling them that you're just like an Orabite. People who are often toothless, have a lot of trash in their lawn, that kind of parallels things you see in the United States, and they just being conscious of certain types of people. Um, poor Afrikaners, poverty among that group is a little bit higher nowadays because so many of them have just left those government positions. They've taken, um, well, their um, like percentage packages, their pension. pension, thank you. They've taken their pension years ago, um, and they're living in the same house that they had before, but they're not receiving the same state of government services, public services to take care of that area. So you do see quite a few poor Afrikaners that have never recovered from a lifestyle in which they'd be handed out and subsidized services, housing from the government. They really identify as just being with an Afrikaner. Oftentimes, they're more conservative. They're angry at seeing blacks getting richer. Um, and a lot of them just are angry with the fact that educational policies are slanted against them. So poor Afrikaners do have a tough time, but they don't really identify with black people. There was a case where actually, I think in Pretoria, there's an article in the national media about how this white family was so poor they moved to a black township. And they were so surprised that people treated them well. Right. They were so surprised that these people are nice to us, they don't hate us because we're white. And even in Popomeni, I'd have white friends come, very liberal white friends who call themselves hippies. And they would want to enter. They're like, are you sure this is safe? Are you really sure we're okay? I'm like, it's fine, just walk down the street. Okay. I'm like, I've never done this before. Like, I've never been in a, in a township before. And they're like looking around them. The only time they go in is with their church group to help volunteer and do that. That's pretty scary, but that's pretty common. The Khoisan people. The Khoisan people. Yeah, the Khoisan people. Do they still have the lost muscles? Do they have the lost muscles? The population of people and their language. And now there is already still a big population. The population definitely pales in comparison to what it was before. But I think there's a pretty concerted effort to kind of explore now Khoisan culture to see the roots of South Africa. Even the Zulu people, people that migrated southwards, they have cliques in their language today that were adopted through interactions with Khoisan. That's where they have their cliques from. So a lot of Khoisan culture exists in little ways, but it's not nearly as big as it was before. Um, you'll see that a lot more of them live in Namibia nowadays. A lot of South Africans will go see, um, will go to like programs where you can learn about the culture, live in their kind of villages. 
in Namibia, parts of South Africa that border nearby, but it's not nearly as prominent as it was before. What exchange program are you on? Is it an exchange program? Um, it was a volunteer program. It's called Radical Journey. Um, I'll preface this by saying I don't specifically personally identify as a Mennonite or even a Christian, but the weird series of interactions I came to encounter Radical Journey, which is through um, a Mennonite program based in Indiana. And I didn't want to join anything that was too white man's burdeny because I wouldn't touch that. I wouldn't allow myself to. Um, really, I even told someone straight to their face, like, if this is white man's burdeny, I'm not doing it. Um, but they're a great organization that helps network people in Pentecostal churches like my host family, um, communities where um, their, th their faith, their background is so far off from even Mennonite theology. Living with them and then networking with very peace-oriented organizations, because the Mennonites are very pacifists. Um, so through that, I managed to get networks, and I have my Indian host family that they already knew because we had local coordinators in Peter Maritzburg. They made connections to Matsu Bumbane, helped get me a job there, and I was so privileged to have the opportunity to work for them. Um, I'm learning so much from them, so it was a pretty good chance of that. And how long were you there? Uh, from summer 2012 to fall 2013, so just over a year. And then I moved to Seattle in Seattle Central, so straight up. Are you guys about the Navarro Los Blue Reeds? Blue Reeds, River? Blue River. Blue I didn't understand very well that that was the British, the one who won the, the war against the king, or was like the African people. Because I was a little confused in that part. I didn't understand if it was like, you know, if it was the British who actually. It was the Zulus who lost. Yeah. So it was the Zulu, the black tribe that had lost the war to the Afrikaners, the, the white group. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them saw that as a great triumph, a great victory. So they turned the river with red with blood, and that was a victory to them. They were happy that they had slaughtered so many people. So what was the news that they put it at all day? <laughs> that day, 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 of day, day of the bell. Oh, day of the bell. The day of the bell. So after that victory, they saw if we had such a successful victory against these people, then of course God wants us to have South Africa. God wants us to have this land. So we're going to dedicate a church, dedicate this day to our victory. It's manifest testimony. It is manifest testimony. Okay, so do you have a few minutes? If people are talking, you can ask them. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Jennifer but I'm going to start wrapping it up. Thank you all for coming. We love to have students present. So if you're passionate <coughs> about a topic, come talk to me or find Kelly Drops right there. I'm not sure if you've done it. But I'll be at the desk for the next four hours. And let's get that hand.